Welcome, I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the great privilege of serving as the president of Hunter College, where online or on campus, the American dream continues to come true as it has in the 150 years since our founding. As our Zoom audiences have come to know, Hunter's commitment to keeping our community informed and inspired, even in a time of social distancing, has never been stronger. And even as we mark the somber one-year anniversary of the COVID-19 lockdown. Over the past 12 months, we have reached thousands of people through Zoom, engaging them in discussions and conversations with thought leaders and activists in every imaginable discipline. Some programs have been designed to provide us relief from the unrelenting anxieties of the pandemic, but many have focused on the vital choices we must make in lockdown or no lockdown to help us through this crisis and light the path to a safe future. Today's event is no exception. It focuses on how we will choose our city's leaders for the next four years under a brand new primary election voting system we've never employed before. It's so appropriate that today's special event is hosted virtually by our Roosevelt House, the one time home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. FDR and Eleanor's commitment to public policy and human rights reached full flower in this landmark building and continues to inspire us today with our public policy institute now located there. From the time they moved in back in 1908, the Roosevelts dedicated themselves not only to aspirational policy, but also to the nitty gritty of practical politics. FDR ran his campaigns for governor and presidents here and learned here to use the new technology of radio to communicate with the public. And it was here that while her husband labored to regain his health after being stricken by polio, the once painfully shy Eleanor became a brilliant public speaker and political celebrity in her own right, rallying voters for FDR and listening to and relating their concerns as her husband's eyes and ears. Eventually, she morphed into a political insider who remained active in New York politics until the end of her life on such a granular level that she spent her final years trying to unseat a powerful old school clubhouse district leader and replace him with a reformer, a young man named Ed Koch. Eleanor would have probably been one of the first to register to attend today's discussion or even to have led it. In her famous newspaper column, My Day, Eleanor once described primary elections as the closest we get to democracy in action, particularly in cities where one party dominates politics. She urged political experts to educate the voters to produce what she called a more informed vote. Eleanor bemoaned low election turnouts like the ones we have been experiencing in recent mayoral cycles and left us this warning. Our low voting rate discredits democracy and the type of representative republic we have chosen as our way of government. It also discredits us because we have offered this form of government to the world. I hope the people of our country will vote this year as responsible, well-informed citizens. Mrs. Roosevelt wrote those words more than 60 years ago, but as usual, when it comes to Eleanor, they might easily have been composed today, just for today's very program. Eleanor, who loved Hunter College, truly lived and breathed our longtime motto, Mihi Cora Futuri, the care of the future is mine. One of the most challenging, most perplexing, and the most important process issues facing voters in 2021 is the newly established system of ranked voting. This June, just a few months from now, primary voters will be asked to vote for their first, second, and third choices for mayor, controller, and city council, launching a brand new era of citywide voting protocols designed to eliminate expensive runoff elections and give voters a chance first time around to identify their top selections for municipal legislative and executive leadership. Well, how do we navigate this brave new world? How does ranked voting work? What will ballots actually look like? How has it changed the way candidates are campaigning and how will it affect the outcomes? Does it enhance equity or threaten it? 
Fortunately, we have a panel today that can help us address and answer those questions. Harold Holzer, our Jonathan Fenton Director of Roosevelt House, and I are pleased to have you with us for this important discussion, the first in a series of Roosevelt House public programs on the 2020 New York City elections. Let me introduce our experts and activists here to discuss the whys and hows of ranked choice voting. First, we are absolutely delighted to welcome Luke Hayes, campaign manager of Rank the Vote NYC, who actually spearheaded and successfully led this effort to introduce ranked choice voting to New York City. Congratulations on that success, Luke. Since its adoption, Luke has launched efforts to educate voters, candidates, campaigns, and community groups on the changes coming to our local elections. He certainly knows the system and how to reach voters. Luke served as field director for the Obama presidential campaign. He led the municipal ID campaign for New York City. And he's a progressive leader who translates reform instincts into grassroots action. He has also run a number of local races and served most memorably as campaign manager for freshman Congressman Jamal Bowman's amazing 2020 primary election victory in the Bronx and Westchester district where Luke was raised. Luke is truly making his mark among a new generation of innovative political activists. We are so pleased to have him with us tonight and to welcome Luke to the Hunter family as an inspiration to our Hunter student activists. We are also very pleased to welcome Jerry Goldfeder, special counsel at the law firm of Strook, Strook and Levan, who has served as special advisor to the American Bar Association's Election Law Committee and is chair of the New York State Bar Association's 2020 Presidential Task Force. There's an expression often used by local political pros when they can't answer questions about the city's Byzantine election law process, and that's Ask Jerry. His 40-year election law practice has included representing high-profile candidates and elected officials, including mayors, governors, members of Congress, and presidents of the United States. Jerry, you are truly the expert in this field. We welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. Tonight's moderator is the amazing Melba Miller, who serves as CEO of the Association for a Better New York, where she previously led the organization's crucial Census 2020 initiative. Melba has had a distinguished career in public service. She is the former Deputy Borough President of Queens and Director of Queens Economic Development. We are so proud that Melva is a 2004 graduate of Hunter's Silverman School of Social Work and is currently a PhD candidate in social welfare at the CUNY Graduate Center. Melva is currently serving her second stint as a Grove leader in Hunter's special program designated to mentor and train our future leaders in public service. Our Grove students, Melva, could have no more knowledgeable and inspiring a teacher than you. Thank you to all of our guests for being with us to explain the sea change in local politics. We are eager to learn and pleased to welcome Melvin Miller to kick off our program. Welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, President Rapp, for that amazing introduction. And I am so honored to be here once again with my Hunter family. Uh, it's always an honor to participate in the very important programming uh, now virtually that is offered by Roosevelt House. And tonight's uh, conversation is extremely important. Um, and I'm so glad to see so many of you have joined us to learn about ranked choice voting and what that means in this election cycle. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversation in the day-to-day -day discourse about the 2021 elections here in New York City and how it has the impact to have the largest um, uh, chance of reshaping the city's political and social landscape in recent election histories. And uh, President Rapp talked a lot about what that means for the city. 
uh, you know, th this year alone, there's probably an estimated uh, 500 candidates running for mayor, controller, public advocate, two district attorneys, five borough presidents. You know, we have some that are uh, running for re-election, uh, some that are new candidates, and two thirds of the city council seats, right? So this is an enormous election cycle. And within this, we know that New York City has historically had a low turnout in all elections, despite the high levels of voter registration by New York City residents. And in local elections, right, voter turnout is even lower. According to the New York City Campaign Finance Board in 2017, only 26% of registered voters participated in the mayoral general election. And in predominantly Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, BIPOC communities, voter turnout was as low as 8.2%. Now we know that there are reasons uh, other than people just not wanting to vote, right? Why voter turnout is so low and we must address these issues, right? With ethnic and racial minority populations in the United States rising, there's a growing population of voices that still remain uncounted for in these elections. Even in 2021, in many places around this country, Restrictions on uh, the way people vote in the election system have resulted in a systematic discrimination towards minority populations, making them ineligible to vote uh, with voter ID laws, uh, not being able to locate polling sites um, on election day, the need for translated voting materials, all are reasons that the turnouts have been greatly lower. Now, what does this mean and why does this matter? It matters because history and current voting restriction practices tells us that not all resident populations have the same history with voting, right? So they will participate in this voting system differently. So it's not just a matter of telling people that they should go out and vote. We need to address the reasons why some individuals don't vote and give them the tools and resources so that they can do that and remain and remove any barriers and obstacles to voting. And that's what we're here to talk about today. One of those barriers, potential barriers, right? This year, as President Rabb explained, New Yorkers will use ranked choice voting for the first time for mayor, public advocate, controller, borough president, and the city council. On top of all of that, you have COVID-19 that has altered voting practices and methods of how you engage voters, right? Not to mention voters are not accustomed to things like early primary date in June, right? So with all of these things in mind, we need to make sure that we are giving voters the tools that are necessary for maximum participation. And in a place like New York City, local elections matter, right? The local, local leaders that we elect and the policies that they create impact our daily lives from schools and parks and roads and taxes. Local leaders make these decisions that affect our lives. So getting them involved, having them participate uh, and elect leaders are important to reflect their priorities, our priorities. With the 2020 elections, uh, 2021 elections fastly approaching, it's fundamental that we get these populations activated, educated, and voting. So again, that is what we are here to discuss today. Today, we will discuss how ranked, cho vote, ranked choice voting works. We will discuss how the ballots will look and function differently. We will talk about how New York City adopted ranked choice voting and the way that it came in, the process and, and the advocacy and who was for and against it. We will talk about how it changed the way in which candidates are campaigning, right? And the implications for voter equality. And we will also talk about the impact on election outcomes. So today we are joined by two esteemed panelists who will talk a little bit about that and I would like them to introduce themselves and then talk a little bit about their work in this space of ranked choice voting. So first, uh, if we can have uh, Jerry Goldfeder, if he can talk a little about, introduce himself and talk a little about the work that he's doing. Sure. Well, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. The first thing I want to say, given all your very important remarks, is presidential election is behind us. Impeachment, the second impeachment of Donald Trump is behind us. But we really need to be very vigilant because across our country, state legislatures are attempting to enact laws to restrict voting. 
And the United States Constitution uh, uh, allows states to regulate their own elections, even federal elections, even for president of the United States. That's why we have so many different uh, kinds of uh, voting processes um, in this country, um, which of course gets us to rank choice voting. I'm an election lawyer. I teach uh, election law at Fordham Law School and have done so at uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School. I've been in this uh, space for many, many years and I appreciate this uh, opportunity to speak to the uh, to the audience and, and be here with uh, uh, you, Melva, and you, Luke, uh, today. Um, this is the first time I've met Melva, and I know you by reputation. You've done great work. And this is the first time I've been on a, a Zoom with uh, my friend, uh, Luke, who, as in the introduction, it was mentioned that he managed a congressional campaign uh, against the candidate who I represented, Elliot Engel, but apparently they did a better job. And Elliot is uh, now uh, uh, um, into the next chapter of his, of his life. So as, as I mentioned, every state has its own election laws pursuant to the constitution. And therefore we have a, not only a variety of, of different ways we elect people, but we also have confusion because of the different uh, procedures that we have. Take New York. We have a closed primary system for the most part, which means you need to be an enrolled Democrat or enrolled Republican or what have you in order to vote in the primary. A lot of people think that that's not fair, that they should be able to vote, especially in, in, in what is more or less a one-party town, but that is all law. New Hampshire, for example, is very different. If, if when they have a presidential primary, a person can change their uh, party enrollment on the day of the uh, presidential primary and vote. Today, I'm a Republican. I want to vote in the Republican primary. Today, I'm a Democrat. I want to vote in the Democratic primary. And then there are then there are states that have open primaries where everybody can vote and no party is listed. California, they have something what they call a jungle primary where the top two winners of a primary go on to November, not the top Democrat and the top Republican, but the top two vote getters. So you can have a, in a general election, uh, two Republicans or two Democrats. The reason I'm mentioning these few examples is to demonstrate that uh, every state really controls its own election procedures. And it's not so crazy and it's not so unusual that a state or a municipality will change its voting procedures. So the most important lesson is this is not so complicated. Don't be nervous. It's actually quite simple, this ranked choice voting. And we did it by amending the city charter of the city of New York. People voted for it. People of the city of New York voted for this reform. They don't have it in Syracuse. They don't have it in Albany because not only do states control their own elections, but in New York, at least, municipalities have different voting procedures. We're the only ones, New York City is the only one that have, has a campaign finance program the way we do in the rest of the state. It's, it's all private funds. And now we will be the only municipality that has ranked choice voting. The one complicating factor that you should be a little nervous about, but I hope you'll overcome it, which is that we will have that ranked choice voting for the municipal elections, as Melba said, but we won't have ranked choice voting. We'll have quote unquote normal voting for other uh, people running, uh, people running for other public office, uh, of, uh, of, uh, public officials. So when we go to the polls uh, for this primary in June, we'll be voting, as Melba said, for all the municipal officers, but we'll also be voting for district attorney, for judge of the civil court, for party officials. And for those, we won't use ranked choice voting. So I want to put up on the screen uh, so that you can see what I mean, two kinds of ballots that we will have uh, this coming June. So the first one, if you can move that up just a bit, and I don't know if you can enlarge, no, I mean move it down is really what I mean, sorry. So this is what we are used to. On the left-hand column 
It says member of the state committee. That's a political party position. And there are four names and you vote for one. And in the center and the left and on the right hand side, we also have different positions and you vote for one candidate to be elected um, in, for that position. And that's the way we've always done it. You vote for one candidate for mayor in the Democratic primary or one candidate for the city council in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary. But now we're going to have this ballot for district attorney, civil court judge, political uh, party positions like these. At the very same time, we're going to have ranked choice voting. Now you could move that uh, down, please. And here, we'll look at the left, it says mayor, and you have five candidates running for mayor. And you see that there are five columns. You vote for one, two, three, four, five in each one of the columns. By the way, we can vote for up to five. We don't have to vote for all five. We can vote for one and two. We can just vote for one. We can vote one, two, three. You can't vote for the same person more than once. The first name is Tegan Kelly. That person can't be my first choice and my second choice. No, I need a different person if I'm going to choose a second uh, candidate. So we're going to have two different ballots and the Board of Election in its wisdom hasn't figured out yet if we're going to have two pieces of paper, two different ballots, or we're going to have this on the same uh, face of one ballot, or maybe on one side we'll have ranked choice and on the other side we'll have uh, 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 voting uh, by uh, just choosing one. So it's not clear yet by the Board of Elections how they're going to deal with uh, a, a primary election that has both ranked choice voting and so-called regular voting where you're just voting for one. That's really the only complicating factor. So um, we're gonna show you now, um, I'm gonna show you a little video and then Luke is going to go into, the, into more specifics. We're gonna show you a little video about ranked choice voting. Hey, NYC voters, there's a new way to vote for your city officials in 2021. The city of New York will use the ranked choice voting method for all NYC primaries and special elections for mayor, public advocate, comptroller, borough president, and city council. Ranked choice voting gives New York voters more choice than ever before. Rather than choosing just one candidate, now you have the option to rank up to five of your favorite candidates. Here's how it works. Mark your ballot by order of preference, ranking as many or as few candidates as you like. In the first column, fill in the oval next to your first choice candidate, your second choice in the second column, followed by your third, fourth, and fifth choice. At the close of election day, all first choice votes are counted. The candidate to receive over 50% of votes wins. If no candidate receives over 50% of the first choice votes, the race moves to round two. The person with the least number of votes is eliminated. If your first choice candidate does not win and they're eliminated, we then count your second choice vote and add it to the candidate's total. This process continues until we have a winner. Go to vote.nyc to learn more about NYC ranked choice voting and upcoming elections. Cute, right? They make it sound so simple. It's actually pretty simple and I'm gonna send it over to Luke now because he's going to get into the specifics and see how what we've learned from this little video. Luke. Thank you, Jerry. Evening, everyone. Uh, so happy to be here. Um, my name is Luke Hayes, uh, born and raised in the Bronx, and uh, happy to be uh, seeing ranked choice voting become reality. Uh, I worked on the ballot initiative in 2019, and uh, excited to see it uh, happen uh, this year uh, for all these municipal elections. So what I'm going to do is we're going to have a sample ballot. Um, I'm going to put this in the chat, and it's a link to a sample ballot that we use. And you can, uh, you can vote along with me. 
Uh, so for this ballot, it's in honor of uh, Black History Month, which just ended. Uh, so we will have a women's history ballot uh, soon. Uh, we didn't have it ready for today. Uh, but if you want to click on that link, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to I'm going to fill it out with you. Uh, so you can fill it out with me and then we're going to go through the results so you can see how ranked choice voting works and uh, we can uh, get into questions. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. All righty. Um, so to sign in and vote, uh, this is not an email scam. Uh, we are not going to be uh, spamming you. So you can enter um, you can enter a fake name. As you can see, I've done that before. Uh, so I'm going to go with uh, JKL. And then my email address is also JKL. Um, and I'm going to submit. Um, and now I'm going to, here's my ballot. Uh, so which historic black meter would I like to see on the $100 bill? Um, so we're going to scroll down. Uh, we have a lot of good options here. Uh, so we have Shirley Chisholm, we have Frederick Douglass, we have John Lewis. You can read the list yourself. Uh, so I've done this uh, ballot a few times. Um, so for the first choice, uh, I'm going to go through this and I'm going to go uh, with Maya Angelou as my first choice for this ballot. Um, my second choice, I'm going to go to Bayard Rustin. He's a personal favorite of mine, a great organizer. Um, if you don't know about him, you should read about him. So he's going to be my second choice. Uh, for my third choice, I'm going to go to Ida B. Wells. Um, for my fourth choice, I'm going to go to Frederick Douglass, uh, OG, like ahead of his time, um, you know, for my, for my fourth choice. And finally, for my fifth choice, I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with Rosa Parks. Uh, so that's my ballot. You can see my five choices right here. And I'm going to go and I'm going to submit. You mean and I vote. You can vote for John Lewis. Uh, it's a tough, it's tough, <laughs> you know. Uh, five, you know, we have up to five rankings. Um, uh, I don't think any ballot looks quite like this. Um, but uh, we're going to go to the results now. So we're going to check. There we go. And wait a second here. Um, so while we're waiting, um, a couple things to keep in mind. You can rank up to um, you can rank up to uh, five candidates. It doesn't mean you have to use all five rankings. That's completely up to you. Um, it's not a, an essential uh, part of uh, you know your ballot. You can say I like these three candidates for council, or I like these four candidates for mayor. It's entirely up to you. Um, all right, we're gonna close that out, and I'm gonna try this one more time. Um, all right, there we go. Um, so uh, here's the ballot and here are the results. Uh, so as you can see, other people have voted in this before and we have the votes to win and we can see the winner. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slow this down so you can see how this ballot works and how the tallying works. Um, so in our first round of voting, here's the initial results from everyone's first choice. So you can see Shirley Chisholm is in the first place and uh, unfortunately, uh, a personal hero of mine, Bayard Rustin, is in last place. You can see down here. Uh, so the way ballot counting is going to go is they're going to tally it up on everyone's first choice. And they're going to say, OK, Bayard Rustin, he's got the least amount of votes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take him out and we're going to reallocate all the second place votes. Uh, so let's take a minute here. He has 12 votes. So let's see if 12 people redistributed their votes. So I'm going to go to next. And you can see there's a little bit of movement uh, for some people. Right, so Bayard Rustin was at 12 votes. Uh, when we reallocated the second choice, uh, Shirley Chisholm went from 63 votes to 67. So you can see a little bit of the change in numbers. Um, the second choice votes of Bayard Rustin got redistributed uh, to our, our different candidates. Uh, so then we see the, we keep on going with the tally. We see Maya Angelou is uh, with the least amount of votes. She's at 18. So we're gonna go to next and we're gonna see those 18 uh, uh, votes get redistributed. Um, so we see here Shirley Chisholm picked up some, Rosa Parks picked up some second place votes. Um, and again, we're going to go again, um, and uh, Rosa Parks has the least amount of votes. So we're going to go to her. We're going to take her 24 votes, look at her second choice, and we're going to redistribute them. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind is there's such a concept as exhausted ballots. So some people might go in, they're going to say, I'm going to vote for one person and no one else. Um, so that becomes an exhausted ballot because let's say uh, they came in and they voted for Bayard Rustin, and that was their only vote. Um, then their second choice isn't uh, factored in because there is no second choice. Uh, so which each round we see as these redistributed uh, second choice votes come. So we have Malcolm X is the next person. Um, his 28 votes get redistributed. You can see um, each, each bar graph moves up just a little bit um, until we get to our final rounds. Um, so interesting note here is a lot of Ida B. Wells 
uh, voters, their second choice was more frequently Frederick Douglass and John Lewis. So you can see the numbers flip there, right? So uh, John Lewis is 49 to 47. Uh, when we redistribute Ida B. Wells' second choice, uh, we see Frederick Douglass surge uh, to 55 votes. Um, and then we have John Lewis, um, his votes get redistributed. Um, and then Frederick Douglass is in third. Uh, his votes, uh, his 60 votes get redistributed and we see Shirley Chisholm uh, gets over 50%, 50 plus one. Uh, so here, that's the quick and dirty uh, version of ranked choice voting. Um, it's simple, it's straightforward. Uh, we have uh, software that does these tabulations instantaneously. Uh, so we're working uh, with the CFB and the BOE to make sure this works um, as seamlessly as possible. Um, the timeline for counting votes does take a little bit longer than usual, but that's because um, if you voted for a candidate that came in fifth, sixth, or seventh place, your vote still counts. And that's what's amazing about ranked choice voting is you don't have to feel like you have to choose only one person. Uh, you get a, you get to say these three candidates for mayor are really speaking to me about transportation, or these four candidates for mayor are really speaking to me about housing. I want to make sure that position, that vision is heard. Uh, so it gives you more opportunity to make sure your voice is heard. Um, and we do rankings all the time. Um, the example I use a lot is for those of you out there that have children, uh, you might have one, one kid who loves spaghetti meatballs, another kid who loves chicken tenders. Uh, they don't like each other's dish, right? So they're not gonna, they're not gonna see it any ground. They're not gonna eat their siblings dish, but you know that both of them really like tacos. Uh, so as a compromise, uh, you're gonna have tacos, right? So tacos are their second choice. Uh, so when we talk about consensus uh, candidates and consensus uh, picks, this is where it really comes into play. Uh, so you as a voter, maybe your first choice doesn't get elected mayor, maybe your first choice doesn't get chosen to city council, but your second choice does. Um, that second choice candidate uh, maybe really spoke to you um, about issues that are important to you. So uh, that's ranked choice voting and how we, uh, we go through this. Um, I encourage all of you to share this link with your friends um, and you can walk through the process. It's supposed to be fun. Uh, we want people to think about, you know, as they're going to candidate forums, as they're listening to people speak, you don't have to say, oh, this person's my favorite and that's it. You can say these three people had really good answers on transportation for New York City. I'm going to keep that in mind. Um, so I'm going to stop there and pass it back to Melva. We can get into questions. Thank you so much, Luke. I love that interactive tool. It really shows sort of the process and how um, the candidates' votes get redistributed, and it, and it does it in a very interesting and creative way. And uh, I encourage everyone, as Luke just suggested, to you know take the link and share it with your family and your friends. Um, you know we have. Uh, two more special elections coming up very shortly, but in time for the primary, this is good practice and it's a good illustration and to show how simple and easy ranked choice voting could be. I also like today's um, uh, sample look because it not only sort of illustrated the process, but it all also gave a little bit of black history. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we got a little insight into your favorites. Uh, which I really appreciate it. Well, but um, I, I, just want, I just wanted to add something. So if, if you notice, that um, uh, Luke's first choice, uh, Shirley Chisholm, was leading for every round. Now that won't necessarily happen. If, if no candidate gets 50%, the, the candidate with the least uh, number of votes, their second uh, the voter's second choice on those ballots will be distributed just as uh, Luke showed us. In Maine, uh, they now have ranked choice voting throughout the state. There was a congressional election in Maine in 2018 where there were four candidates running and the person, the Republican was leading on the first round but didn't get 50%. The third and fourth candidates were eliminated and on the second round, the Democrat pulled ahead and got 50%. So that's a, 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 a tricky part of ranked choice voting. The voter gets more of a choice in the way she or he votes, but the winner of a particular first round is not necessarily going to be the winner when all the votes are counted after a second or perhaps third round in order for someone to get 50%. Thank you, thank you for that, Jerry. So um, let's open this up. Let's start with some questions. And I encourage the audience, if you have questions, please submit them. We're gonna open it up for audience Q&A a little later. 
Um, but you know, we, we were talking about sort of ranked choice voting being enacted the first time in here, New York, in here in New York City, but we know that ranked choice voting uh, has worked in other cities. Uh, so starting uh, with you, Jerry, can you talk a little bit about sort of how this has worked in other places, its successes, its failures, uh, compromise in between? Um, how has this fared out in other places across the country? And then I'd love to hear from you, Luke, as well. And, and Luke probably knows a little more about it than, than I do, but it seems to have worked pretty well when it's been used. Uh, the main example, the state of Maine example, is, is really perfect because they've been using it for a few years now, not only for local elections, but congressional and even the presidential election. In San Francisco, they, they've had ranked choice voting and people, people love it there. There's been one city, I think it's St. Paul, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Luke, where the people didn't really like uh, ranked choice voting, so they um, decided to abolish it. But for the most part, it's it's across the country, and people like it because it gives them an opportunity to uh, make more than one choice, and it does change the way people campaign. Because if I'm a candidate running for mayor, I'm not going to attack everybody because I if somebody is supporting and Luke is running against me for mayor and I want you to vote for me number one, but if you're voting for Luke for num number one, I want you to vote for me number two. So I'll say nice things about Luke and I'll tell his supporters, vote for me number two. So that changes the complexion as to how candidates campaign, which we hope uh, changes the, the, the uh, divisiveness that sometimes occurs in, in uh, primary elections. Luke, you want to jump in there? Yeah, uh, to, to Jerry's point, uh, in, in other municipalities and cities that we've seen, uh, or states that have done this, uh, we've seen uh, candidates really go beyond uh, their comfort zone. Um, so to Jerry's point, uh, they, you know, campaign to each and every corner of the district uh, that they're, you know, they're active in. A good example uh, is also in uh, the district attorney's office uh, race in San Francisco. Uh, Chesa uh, won that election for district attorney. Um, and significantly, there was a uh, Chinese candidate uh, that was endorsed by the Chinese community that was, you know, polled very low and ended up becoming, coming in third or fourth place. Um, but Chess's campaign uh, very strategically uh, reached out and engaged the Chinese community. They had ads in, in Ch Chinese. They, you know, sought the, the second endorsement uh, of a lot of organizations there. Um, so a lot of those uh, people that came out to vote for the Chinese candidate, their second choice uh, was to Chessa. And, you know, people were surprised by this just because ideologically they were different. Uh, but I think it showed how um, candidates can be creative in how they're, you know, interacting and how they're engaging people for a second place or third place vote. Um, so it's really nice to see, you know, different candidates thinking about, I'm not just going to go to this building complex or this community. I'm going to go to each and every corner and really say, well, if I can't be your first choice, I'm going to be your second choice. Um, and we, already, and so we not already see that here in New York City, you take a candidate like Scott Stringer, who's, who's running for mayor, whose base is on the west side. He, he goes to uh, virtually and sometimes in person to uh, Eric Adams' base and vice versa, Eric will go to the west side. That's just an example of people trying to go beyond, as Luke put it, uh, their comfort zone. And I think everybody, everybody benefits as a result. Right, so it sounds like, uh, you know, it forces people to campaign outside their natural base and sort of explore, especially as the demographics change, you know, it, it's changing very quickly here in a place like New York City. Um, it, it, it forces candidates to sort of not only create allegiances and work with other candidates, but also expose themselves to populations that, that they wouldn't normally do. Uh, you know, we have the fortunate um, opportunity to sort of look at two races that have happened most recently using ranked choice voting. Uh, both happened to be in Queens. They were two uh, city council special elections. And although we don't um, have the results of those yet, uh, wouldn't either of you like to talk about what we've seen um, from those two races uh, in this new world of not only uh, sort of the change in how people vote and campaign, but also using ranked rank choice voting? Sure. Uh, so uh, the first special election we had in Queens, um, ranked choice voting did not come into play. 
um, uh, Gennaro won with about 57, 58% of the vote. Um, and that's uh, one thing to note about ranked choice voting. Uh, if a candidate on the first round of, of tabulations of voting is over 50%, ranked choice voting won't come into play. Um, so if a majority is won outright by a candidate, uh, there's no need for ranked choice voting. Um, if a candidate doesn't get it to 50%, like we've seen in uh, Council District 31, uh, that's when ranked choice voting comes into play. So right now we're waiting on absentee ballots and military ballots to come in for the special election. Uh, once they are all accounted for and the, the deadline is passed, uh, they will start to be tabulated um, and we'll see ranked choice voting come into come into effect. Um, so there's two, um, there are two candidates, um, uh, Selvina and... Um, uh, Pesa, Pesa. Yes, um, who are at 38 and 35 percent, and the rest of the candidates combined are about 27 percent of the total. Uh, so we'll see, um, you know, we'll see uh, what those second choice choices were for a lot of those candidates and eventually get a majority winner. Jerry, did you want to add anything? No, I think that? That, that that covers it. Gotcha. And uh, I actually live in a 31st councilmanic district, so I got to vote in that. <laughs> election it was really interesting. So let me I, ask you a question. Did you choose five candidates or fewer? I was just about to say that and I <laughs> used my option. I chose five candidates. Um, it was very uh, uh, active in talking to the candidates and understand where they aligned and where those uh, things aligned with the things that I care about. Um, and it was a very easy, simple, but great way uh, to have choices in this election for me. Um, so yeah, I so voted. It'll be interesting that the person who is leading on the first round is not leading by much. And right. both of them have, they're in the thirties. So it'll be very interesting to see how the remaining candidates get their uh, second place votes uh, distributed to see if that changes or not. Absolutely, absolutely. And, it, and it just understanding the geography of where the candidates live and come from and where their natural base is, it's gonna be interesting how that turns out. Uh, both the, the two leading candidates are from the Rockaway Peninsula. So that's going to be interesting um, how that turns out. So looking forward to seeing that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, and you guys started talking about this, but you know, let's dive into why this system is better, right? And why the system might be better than a runoff system uh, or the 40% threshold system, right? If we take, for example, if we look at uh, the mayoral election of David Dinkins, the late great mayor uh, who recently passed, uh, reached uh, once in a four-way uh, race with Koch and Golden and Ravage, why, how is this system better or is it? Well, in, in, um, in that race in 1989, um, there were four candidates and only two, uh, Dinkins and Koch got into the runoff and they were very close and Golden and uh, Ravage got very few votes because of the dynamics of the race. It became a two person race uh, by the end but neither one of them had uh, 40%. And New York, it's, it's been very funny because we've only had runoff elections in New York for mayor, city council president, which then turned into public advocate and controller of the city of New York. Not for borough president, not for city council, not for any other public office in the state of New York. And by the way, the genesis of that is interesting. We did that in the early 1970s because the Democratic primary of 1969, somebody who was more conservative than most of the Democratic Party squeaked by with a plurality in the Democratic primary and became the standard bearer. And because he was more conservative, uh, people felt that, well, he didn't really get a, he didn't get a majority and his plurality was very small. So let's change that so that in order to win a primary, you need 40%, at least for those three top offices. There's another theory involved with why that was established, which was to prevent Herman Badillo, who would have been the first Hispanic mayor of the city of New York, to prevent him from ever winning the nomination. And in fact, he never did win the nomination. So there was a reason, there was an ideological reason, and then there was a racist reason for establishing runoffs um, in, in New York City. And what we've seen over the years is sometimes uh, a citywide candidate 
has gotten over the four, uh, over 40% and we've avoided uh, a, a, a runoff. But sometimes the vote has been pretty close and we've had to go to the polls in two weeks or they've changed it to three weeks uh, for the runoff. And the turnout is, as, as, Melba, as Melba was saying early on, introducing the program, turnout in New York is, is poor. And turnout in runoffs is even worse. Plus, it costs a lot of money to, to, uh, to have an election. So it's thought that we already, we're doing, we're, we're having our runoff on the very day that we're voting. That's the purpose of ranked choice. So that if our first person uh, that there's, we voted for our first and second and third choices. So if no one gets 50%, we go to the, we go to the ballots of the eliminated candidates and it, they're distributed. That's an instant runoff. That's another name for ranked choice voting is instant runoff. So we don't have to worry about uh, poor turnout at the polls and we don't have to worry about um, spending more taxpayer dollars in a second election. Thank you. Luke, did you want to add to that? Nope. Okay. <laughs> He's like, no, got to go. Um, so we, I just have one last question before we open it up to audience questions, because we have some really great audience questions and we have a lot of them, which is great. Um, but, you know, in thinking about the moment in time that we're in in this city, as we think about recovering, as we think about sort of economic recovery and, and health uh, recovery, we think about disparities um, in cities that exist that COVID-19 exposed, right? We want to make sure that we have representation that really talks to the plural polarity of, of, of our city, right? Those who actually live here um, and the things that they care about. And when we think about this new system and we think about how we elect uh, our local leaders, right? We want to make sure that we have both voter equity. So can we, this is a multiple part question. So I'd love for both of you to talk a little bit about what the impact is on voter equity, uh, guaranteeing that representation by all voters happen. Um, and how do we sort of educate people about this system? I mean, you know, uh, many of us, including you both uh, on the Zoom today, have really been out there and working with community-based organizations and talking about ranked choice voting. But, you know, when we want to make sure that we, that this process is really representative, right? How do we educate, what's the best way to educate the electorate of, around sort of this new voting system? Well, I think what we're doing is attempting to educate people and there are a lot of Zooms the Board of Elections is doing it, the Campaign Finance Board are doing it, civic groups are doing it, political clubs are doing it. We're all doing it in, in order to try to get people to really understand this, I think, relatively simple process, even though it sounds so complicated. What the impact is going to be, the answer is I don't know. We'll have to see if it really does change the makeup of those who are elected or not. I'm not certain that it's designed for that purpose, I think it's designed to make voting easier, but I'm not sure that uh, we can expect uh, the, the, uh, a greater diversity of our elected, of elected officials as a result of this change procedure. In, in other municipalities, we have seen uh, an increase in, in women and, and candidates of color winning elections. Um, and I think for, for this round in New York City, uh, that's one approach people can take to their ballot. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, there's uh, a dearth of, of, of women in city council and that's an, an issue to be addressed. Um, so that might be a consideration for someone. If there's seven candidates running for council, you might wanna rank all three women to make sure that you have a woman representing you uh, in city council uh, next, you know, next year. Or um, in CD24, we saw uh, quite a few um, candidates uh, that were South Asian. Um, and I know some people voted for, you know, for South Asian candidates because they wanted to have the first South Asian candidate, uh, you know, become a city councilor. So I think there's a couple of different ways to approach the ballot, uh, whether it's on issue, ethnicity, gender. Uh, I think that's up to the voters. Uh, but I think it does allow for uh, this sort of creative thinking um, and, and really kind of thinking about, you know, what sort of representative you want for uh, your community um, in, in city council or mayor or borough president. Uh, so we'll see, uh, you know, if people take that approach, uh, but certainly I think there's a lot of different ways you can uh, determine how you're going to rank and who you're going to rank. 
Yeah, and, and just to, to go about go back to sort of again, you know, um, the, the the sample that was used earlier, Luke, of uh, the link, you know, unfortunately, not uh, all of uh, the voters are able to jump on a webinar or learn and try to find sort of creative ways to get this information out. I think using all the tools at our disposal, whether it be, you know, sample ballots in food pantries, um, as we do PPE distribution mm -hmm. online at vaccination sites. Um, you know, whether, you know, a lot of our disconnected populations use closed messaging apps, right? So getting sort of shareable graphics or shareable links in those WeChats or those, uh, you know, um, Kakao and WhatsApp uh, tools, you know, but really being creative and getting sort of this very, to, to Jerry's point, very simple uh, process, once people understand it, it's a very easy tool to use, um, but getting it out there uh, so that people are comfortable with it, know about it, so they're not surprised when they get to uh, the voting booths. Um, but thank you both for that. Um, so I'm actually going to turn it over to Mac, who will facilitate the audience Q&A. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to do this part of uh, the program, and I'm going to sit back and listen to all of the great questions by the audience. Thank you, Melva. Thank you, Jerry and Luke. This has been great. And as a result, there are lots and lots of questions. Um, before I begin sharing those with you, just a point of clarification with regards to Mayor Dinkins. He did win the 1989 primary without a runoff, getting not only more than 40%, but more than 50% against three opponents, including a three-term incumbent mayor. Um, well, this is well, on our minds at Roosevelt House because we, we just had a, a, you, an event exploring you, his legacy. You're, you're uh, absolutely right. I stand corrected. Okay, so um, the first question from Roosevelt House Director Harold Holzer. If you are very, very passionate about say a mayoral candidate, what helps his or her candidacy more? Bullet voting only for your favorite or maybe even trying to game the system by choosing people with absolutely no chance as your second and third, et cetera, choice. Um, I, would, I would say that putting a fringe candidate or someone that's not polling well as your second, third and fourth choice is almost equivalent to bullet voting uh, just because that candidate may be eliminated in the first round of voting. Uh, so your second choice, you know, may not come into play. Um, one thing I want to stress is uh, if you have a favorite candidate, uh, putting a second, third or fourth choice doesn't hurt your favorite candidate, right? Your second choice only comes into play if your first choice uh, doesn't make it, um, you know, to the to the final round of, of counting. So if you're passionate about a mayoral candidate, you're not hurting his or her feelings um, or their chances by putting a second and third choice. Um, and my suggestion is always, if there's a candidate that you don't like, uh, you don't have to rank them. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's entirely up to you. I would look less about how to maybe keep one candidate out. And maybe if there's a favorite candidate of yours, see if there are other candidates that share some commonalities with your first choice, uh, just to make sure that if there's an issue or issues that you're passionate about that, you know, that, that voice or that vision is heard. And, uh, a question from Edith Holzer. How will the number of candidates, say for the mayor's race, how will the number of candidates be reduced from the current 30-ish to five? Well, they won't be reduced. Uh, they'll be, unless they drop out or you know discontinue running, uh, no matter how many candidates are on the ballot, we have the choice and the opportunity to vote for as many as five, but only five. Luke, anything to add on that? Okay. Um, as you were going through your explainer, Luke, lots of people were writing in questions about how the votes are redistributed. Among them, Maria Helena, Janet, Georgia Clark, and Clyde Haberman. Clyde asked it this way, it's still not clear to me how the redistribution of votes takes place. If the fifth place candidate has eight votes and he or she is now eliminated, are those eight votes divided equally among the remaining four candidates or is the redistribution weighted in some way? So it's not weighted. We just look at those eight votes and who the second choice was. Um, so I'm gonna use the panelists as an example. Um, I'm gonna put Melva as my first choice. Um, I'm gonna put Jerry as my second choice and Mac as my third choice. Um, now let's say um, after the tallying, uh, Melva doesn't uh, make it to the, you know, she's in third place. Um, so they're going to look at my ballot. They're going to say Jerry was my second choice. So they're going to take my vote. And instead of going to Melva, it then goes to Jerry. So it adds to his total. 
Um, so it's it's not like they're they're not weighted differently. It's just um, after your first choice is eliminated, we look at your second choice, and if your second choice is also eliminated, then we look at your third choice and so forth. Um, so uh, you know, as we were going through the different uh, iterations of you know favorite candidate for the hundred dollar bill, um, you know, Baird Rustin was I think the had the least amount of votes, and then my Angelou was the second least amount of votes. Um, so if my first choice was Baird Rustin. Um, and my second choice is Maya Angelou. Uh, my, my vote would then go to Maya Angelou after Bayard Russell was eliminated. And then Maya Angelou was then eliminated. Um, she was my second choice. So we look at my third choice. And let's say my third choice was Shirley Chisholm. Then my third choice goes to Shirley Chisholm's total. Um, so it's, it's more really a, a matter of uh, there's no waiting or anything like that. It's looking at who my first choice was, who my second choice, and so forth. Um, and as we go through each round, um, if that candidate stays in, uh, my, my, my vote doesn't change. It's just a matter of uh, whether that candidate uh, remains uh, on the ballot um, through, the, through the, the voting rounds. So what's interesting about this is that it's the fact that several people had this question, even though we showed a video, showed slide, we explained it, there's something missing. So that demonstrates that we need to uh, revise our slides so that you can actually see a second play, uh, a ballot um, with first choice, second choice, and how it gets distributed. Um, uh, because uh, obviously, you know, you when, you when you try to teach something and people don't get it, you wonder why they don't get it because you understand it. And this is a, this is a great example of, of people's confusion about this. So we need to do better at that. Yeah, um, Bernard Brackford asks a question along those lines. He says it, it ranked choice voting seems complicated. Is there any concern that it will negatively impact uh, voter turnout, discourage voters? I don't think so. Turnout um, is, yeah. is not driven by the ballot, uh, the form of the ballot. Luke? And, we'll, and I mean, we'll see, but I, don't, I doubt that that will happen. To, and to that point, um, in other cities that have done this, we've seen a slight bump in turnout. Um, and uh, what's encouraging is a low rate of, of uh, tossed ballots. Um, so there are a lot of mechanisms in place to see that your intent is there. Uh, so I saw this question come up a few times and come up in other presentations. If I vote for Melva as my first, second, third, fourth, and fifth choice on the ballot, um, the, as we're tabulating the results, uh, we'll consider your first choice for Melva. And then because you've listed her as your second, third, fourth, and fifth choice, we just count that ballot as one first place vote for Melva and that's it. Um, so you, you can't game the system or add extra votes for your first choice candidate. So we encourage you uh, because that's the, you know, um, uh, you can rank more than one candidate is to not just do one, two, three, four, one candidate because that'll just be interpreted as your first choice was obviously Melba, so we're going to count that towards her total, but your second, third, fourth, fifth choice won't be registered because um, you didn't indicate any sort of differentiation. So there, so there's not necessarily in there. I did, I, I, if I could just jump in, uh, when I went to, to vote uh, a, a last week, a couple weeks ago, uh, I did a sort of unofficial exit poll of uh, some of my neighbors, and for those who did not understand the system, they just chose their the person that they wanted to vote for, right? So it wasn't that they were deterred or didn't participate. They just ended up voting for one person. The, gotcha. the danger here is, is not in the turnout. It's, the, as Luke's example, is that they fill out the ballot incorrectly and then the whole ballot gets tossed. Is, is there in effect no different, Luke, between putting the same candidate in all five slots and just putting him or her in the number one slot? Exactly. That'll, it'll be interpreted as, you know, if you list Melva one, two, and three, or just Melva as one, um, it's, you know, considered a first choice uh, for Melva and that's it. Yeah. Um, a question, an anonymous questioner asks, why was this done? Why has uh, New York City adopted ranked choice voting? Was there any problem with the regular way? Uh, will this not lead to confusion? We've already addressed that aspect. Um, so the, the impetus for this was back in 2009, there was a runoff election for uh, both uh, comptroller and, and uh, public advocate, um, and it was a citywide election. So uh, in response to a rather, you know, a costly special election, which tends to have lower rates of voter turnout, just because any sort of special election tends to have lower rates of turnout, um, Gail Brewer, uh, who's a council member, uh, I think she might be on the call as well. Uh, she introduced a bill, I think in 2010, in response to this to say, 
there's a more effective system uh, to determine, you know, if we have a runoff, then rather than do a special election and runoff, we can do ranked choice voting uh, to then uh, determine, you know, uh, people's, you know, the people's choice. Um, here's a good practical question. Janet Gottlieb asks, at the polls, will there, will there be election inspectors on site who can help explain? I hope so. <laughs> Um, there will be, uh, you know, board of election of, um, workers are being trained on ranked choice voting. Um, we also, like we have had volunteers at early vote locations and polling locations. Campaigns are also active and engaged. And I want to thank a lot of the campaigns out there for engaging on ranked choice voting because they're really helping uh, educate uh, voters as well. Uh, but they're, you know, the, the idea is to have people on hand in person uh, during the early vote and on election day to make sure that people are, have their ballots, they're filled out correctly and they're comfortable with it. Again, from experience who participated, when I went to pick up my ballot, they took the time to explain to me how it worked and gave me a palm card for me to take with me to the voting booth that explained how it worked. So. Well, that's great. Okay. Um, when you say you got a palm card, you, you're talking about the campaign people outside. No, no, it was a board of elections palm card inside. They handed it to me when they handed me my ballot. Oh, you mean an explanatory one? Correct. Yes, ah. explanatory, not a, a not a real palm card telling you how to vote. Oh, correct. Okay. <laughs> um, Carolyn asks: After the election, will we see the first round results, et cetera, or will we only see the final results? Yes. How will history uh, look back on these elections now that they? have ranked choice of voting. Um, yeah, the, the, there's, there's full transparency for each round. Uh, so um, as the votes are tabulated and you know, on the simulation that I showed you, there will be similar sort of access to see like, this was the first tally, tally of votes, this was the second round of votes and so forth. Uh, we wanna make sure people are seeing the process from start to finish. Um, so you'll be able to see first round, second round, third round, and you know who got eliminated and how the votes were distributed. Interesting, okay. Um, is there a campaign, is there an initiative to bring ranked choice voting to the state as a whole? Uh, what do you think are the next steps to get ranked choice voting in our state elections? Uh, I believe there is a bill uh, sponsored by State Senator uh, Liz Kruger. Um, I'll have to double check on that, but I believe there is a bill, um, I don't know how much um, you know, energy is behind that. And I think part of it is advocates of ranked choice voting are, um, I think everyone's is interested to see how it works this year. Um, and I think that'll help give, uh, you know, momentum and examples of, you know, as a, as an effective, uh, election reform. Um, Jake Weiss says that the panel seems to suggest ranked choice voting will incentivize civility among candidates, I assume. I'd like to think you're right, but what happens if that isn't the case? And this convention incentivizes even more gaming of the process. What then? Uh. Well, then, then we've progressed in the sense that we don't have to have a runoff and we've saved taxpayer dollars, but we haven't as progressed as much as we'd like by having more civil uh, campaigns. Um, let's see how it plays itself out. It appears that that's what's happening. It doesn't eliminate negative campaigning, but does reduce it and offer opportunities for collaboration. Um, in the in the mayor's race in San Francisco, there was a commercial by two candidates for mayor saying, "Vote for me and vote for her." Um, so uh, we're seeing iterations of that here in New York. Um, down in the thirty first district, there's actually a press conference by one council member who you know, went over his first, second, and third choice. Um, and we're seeing that as well. Uh, Gustavo Rivera, state senator in the Bronx, uh, had a press conference where he listed his first and second choice for mayor. Um, and we're seeing groups do endorsements like that as well. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, that really opens up possibilities about candidates collaborating around a certain issue or around a certain focus uh, to ensure that uh, a voice or a bill or an initiative is heard, um, you know, from that district. A few people are curious as to why we have uh, ranked choice voting for some elections, but not for others. Uh, Diane, Christina Lang, Martin Emder. Why aren't we doing ranked choice voting for all New York City positions? Why not the DA race? Um, and why only primaries? Why not the well, general? The, why only primaries? It's, it's not just primaries. It's yeah. primaries and special elections. It's not for general elections. Yes. And the, the reason for that is God knows why. 
because I think that that was a, a mistake because that's only going to engender confusion when we go to uh, for to vote in a primary and we have ranked choice voting and then we go to a general and we don't, that's just going to um, uh, exacerbate whatever kinds of confusions uh, there, there exist uh, among the voters. But the reason we have ranked choice voting only for New York City municipal uh, uh, offices is because it was a city charter uh, uh, proposal that eventually passed. And New York City has a number of cities, has 62 cities, and each city can uh, have its own charter and various provisions for the way it conducts its own elections. So New York City enacted term limits. New York City enacted campaign finance reform. New York City enacted ranked choice voting. We can't enact that for non-municipal, non-city offices. District attorney, even though we think of it as a county office and a city office, it's not. It's a New York State office. Judge of the civil court, even though it's a civil court of New York City, as a member of the judiciary, it's a state position. And the political party positions are not public official positions. So we, the city of New York is limited in the kinds of proposals it could make to reform our elections, but we've done so. We've, we've also reduced the number of signatures for, uh, to get on the ballot in New York City. Um, other cities can do the same if they so choose through their own charter um, uh, reform uh, procedures. Uh, and maybe they will once they uh, see how this works here in New York. But that's the reason. That's why I started off by saying that's the one complicating factor that people are gonna go to the polls and have two different types of elections for different pu public official uh, positions. Okay. Um, Luke, uh, this one's for you from Ben Alexander. Can a candidate who has been knocked out of the running in an early round be put back into the running in a later round if enough voters choose that candidate as a second, third, or fourth choice? Uh, no, once they're eliminated, uh, they're out. Um, so yeah, there are people who put them as their second or third choice. Um, they'll just be skipped for the, the next choice on their ballot. Uh, but it, it goes first on who was the first choice and, and eliminates you know, the people with the least amount as, until we get a, a final two. Marilyn Bailey asks, what happens if there's a tie between candidate one and two? Uh, if there is a tie, and this has nothing to do with ranked choice voting, uh, it's a flip of the coin. Um, so um, again, this has been on the books prior ranked choice voting, but if there is a tie it's between actually, two candidates. Actually, in a primary, if there's a tie, it's there's no winner and there's a vacancy. Oh, there isn't a flip of the- only flip a coin in a general. Ah. It's another one of these quirky, ridiculous New York election laws. Um, Nuala Naranjo asks, do we know, and this has been touched on, but maybe there's more to say on it. Do we know how the Board of uh, uh, Education will, I'm sorry, the Board of Elections will work to teach voters that might not know how ranked choice voting works? Will they be sending out new information guides, et cetera? Uh, yes, and hello, Nula. Um, there will be uh, there will be guides being sent out. Uh, so people of, who live in special in districts with special elections out in Queens have gotten uh, mailers from uh, New York City, um, and they've actually actually gotten mailers from Rank the Vote uh, as well. And um, as you know, as we get closer to the general, there will be uh, you know there will be mail pieces. There will be public awareness campaigns. Um, we're collaborating with a lot of local groups uh, to do. Uh, just what we talked about, not just Zoom calls, but lit drops, uh, tabling, uh, texting, phone calls. Uh, we're working with the Queens Public Library, the Brooklyn Public Library, a lot of local groups to help us get in front of people uh, that otherwise may not have access to technology or may not be comfortable with it. Um, so there is, there are efforts currently underway and only going to grow as we get closer to uh, the June election. Great. Um, Emmanuel Zabda. I apologize for that pronunciation, Emmanuel. Um, should we expect increases in the number of signatures needed to get on the ballot as a consequence of more candidates believing they have a chance? No. No? Um, 
Let's see. Um, we are coming to the end of our time, but I'll we just want to find one or two more before we finish up, if that's all right with you all. Um, let's see. Stephen says, asks, why would you get past the second round since someone must have over 50% of votes if there are only two candidates left? Um, so the, the way the round voting goes is until we get to a final two candidates. Um, so that it depends on how many candidates there are. Um, so if there's nine candidates, it'll go, you know, so many rounds until we get to the final two. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, I think it yeah. Does. The, yeah. Um, and this has been touched on as well, but it's important. Colette asks, in places with ranked choice voting, have we seen changes to candidates' platforms as well as their campaigning strategies? Uh, certainly a change in the strategies um, as far as how they're engaging with voters. Um, I think one thing to stress with uh, ranked choice voting is it doesn't uh, favor one ideology over another. Uh, so when we talk about consensus candidates, that's not to say a more moderate or centrist you know, position. Um, it's just to you know, where the electorate is at. Um, so depending on who's running and what issues are being talked about, um, it allows for, you know, uh, it allows for people to talk about it very openly. We found um, because there's ranked choice voting is sometimes those candidates where people like, oh, he or she doesn't have a chance because they're, you know, they don't have a lot of money or they're not very prominent or well-known. With ranked choice voting, you have to worry about wasting a vote on that candidate. So you might, you know, and again, going to Jerry's example, uh, a lot of people voted for a Green Party candidate for Congress in Maine. Um, that candidate didn't win. They were about four or 5% of the vote, but their second choice overwhelmingly was for the Democrat. And that's how Democrats were able to pick up another uh, House seat in Maine. So um, if anything, I think uh, it allows for candidates that may not be considered, you know, mainstream or, you know, uh, well known uh, to have a platform and to speak freely. And for voters to know that if I vote for this candidate, they may not be considered, um, you know, a front runner or, you know, top three or top five that you're not throwing away your vote. You can say I'm going to vote for, for that person uh, because I really like what they're saying about this issue, uh, but my second choice is going to be for maybe someone who's a little better known or has maybe a better chance to, to win. If I can just add it for, for a second, I think that this is, this is a procedural change, a procedural reform, but I don't think it favors any one group, ethnic group, racial group, any kind of uh, interest group in any way, and I don't think it disfavors uh, anyone either. And just to, to jump in uh, for the special election that I voted in, uh, who received a phone call from probably every single candidate that ran in the race. When we talk about strategy, almost every single one said, if I can't be your number one, can I be your number two? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's interesting in terms of strategy, that that's a political strategy that candidates are using if for some reason they don't think they're going to be your number one choice. They're asking so to increase their odds to be your number two. It's really interesting. Um, and this whole talk has been really interesting. And we are just about out of time. Um, I want to thank everybody who has joined us tonight. I think this has been extremely helpful and informative. Um, before we finish, do either do any of the three of you have any final thoughts? I, my only uh, message would just, um, as you're going to these forums for mayor, for council, uh, take a, you know, you can now think about your top three, your top five. Um, and if there are issues that are passion that you're passionate about, or you want to make sure that voice, that vision is heard, um, to think holistically uh, about your ballot um, and that you really have options. Um, there's a lot of people running. Um, I think Melva mentioned there's like, I think now 400 plus candidates. Um, so there's a lot of voices out there. Um, and what's great about ranked choice voting is it gives you, you know, more choice and more power uh, to really make sure your voice is heard um, and that, you know, your, you know, uh, your vision for the city, your, your, you know, your vote um, can really matter um, in, in more than one way. Thank you, Luke. Well, I can't say it better than that. And I encourage everybody to take a deep breath, figure out how to do it. It's not as complicated as it as we've made it sound and uh, make sure you vote. Thanks, Jerry. Melva? Good, thank you. Okay. Thank you all for joining us and engaging in this very uh, important conversation. Uh, the questions were great and there's tons more. I will say, um, is there a way, uh, there are so many unanswered questions on this call. 
uh, if there are a way that they can follow up with either you, Luke, or you, Jerry, if they have any additional questions. Sure. I think what you can do, um, Mac, is uh, print out all the questions and then just send it to us and we can respond it. You know, email it to us and we can respond to it. We can try for that. Yes. Uh, there will be a record of every question asked, yeah. a report, um, which we can share with you. Um, I, I just want to squeeze in one more before we finish up from Harold Holzer. Considering how long it has taken the Board of Education to count votes because of mail-ins, will it take even longer to calculate ranked choice winners? Maybe. <laughs> there's, a, there's an added step. Uh, what's good is we have a uh, software that can do this uh, rather quickly. Um, so once once all the absentee ballots are in and those those deadlines are met, um, uh, it should it should be you know pretty quick. Um, so the only thing that will change is instead of election night parties, we may modify to uh, brunches uh, you know down the road. Um, but uh, you know this will be we want to make sure every vote is counted. And with ranked choice voting, um, it really does matter. Um, you know that what every person's first, second, third, and fourth choice uh, is. Um, so it's a, a little bit longer, but it's uh, the payoff is that we get uh, you know a full a full picture of of what the district and what the city wants uh, for mayor and for city council. You know, Luke may be a little more sanguine than I am with regard to the uh, efficacy that the board of elections brings to uh, its normal procedures, let alone a new procedure. Um, I, I hope they master it uh, in time. Uh, um, but of course, uh, there are there will be fewer uh, victory night celebrations because it's not just the plurality; it's a fifty percent. So there'll be far fewer. I would think it's a guess. I would think there will be far fewer uh, winners on election night uh, who have gotten the fifty percent, and therefore we will need to go to the second round, and we won't be able to go to the second round until all the affidavit and absentee and military ballots are counted, which doesn't even start uh, until the following week after the primary. So when all is said and done, there might be uh, many more uh, uh, primary elections uh, that take longer than, than we're used to. And God willing, the Board of Elections knows how to uh, deal with this, uh, this new procedure. All right, well, we'll make that the final thought. Thank you, Jerry. And thanks again to everybody who joined. Thanks to the panel. Good night. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you.